getting a two for one on the on the mark podcast this morning there they are if you're watching on youtube smiley and handsome it's Bo watson and shannon shusky hey boys uh welcome to the show how are you doing hey mark thanks for having us yeah. absolutely yeah look you're the bonus shannon because i knew about Bo, but switching <laughs> on the the zoom call and seeing you has made my day they all the brighter man <laughs> thanks <laughs> okay well let's in the interest of, b- before we get into the stuff i'm a big one on folks around the world part of our tribe getting to know who you are so bo why don't you kick it off give us a little bit of a whistle stop uh, on, on your background your biography please yeah absolutely you know i'm like most golfers uh for those that maybe been playing a game since an early age i started very young i was uh hooked from an early age of five years old and my dream was to play on the pga tour and so mark I had a lot of success in junior golf Mm -hmm. and was doing really well. But then high school comes and I plateau. And unfortunately, the reason for that was because like many people that are probably listening to this right now and probably going through this right now in their own game, I was trying to get that extra edge. I was studying everything I get my hands on. I was living on uh, Golf Channel Academy Live every night (laughs) and I'm trying everything under the sun. And unfortunately, the search for the perfect swing crashed me. And uh, unfortunately, my game took a nosedive. And, you know, when I get to my senior year in high school, I had a decision to make. I could either go to like a D2, D3 school, or I go to Campbell University and try to keep my dream alive by going to a guy named David Orr. Those that don't know David Orr, I know he's been a past guest. Right? Show, yeah. mm-hmm. So I, uh, at the time, now here's the funny thing about David. David at the time was actually working with a lot of guys on full swing. And he's kind of, you know, went head head in to you know putting instruction so he's known as the best putting coach in the world uh him and phil Kenyon kind of share that title and they're battling over that but the funny thing is he's kind of come out of retirement uh here recently and done some full swing stuff with alex molly so that's uh that's a side story but main thing is i'm there i actually am trying to learn from him teach my own self and i you know i feel like i could keep my dream alive by doing that well by being around him man his passion is so contagious I just fell in love with teaching a game. And as a result, I took a side uh, step and after school, I actually opened my own golf school and I go down this path. And I'm a type A personality. I want to literally help every single person that comes to me. And Mark, I was having a lot of success. Uh, We were tracking our data with all of our students that I was working with. We were seeing about 4.7 shots dropped on average for all of our students that came to me in person. You got Over people. You got people paying attention there, like four point seven. Yeah, I'm gonna win the weekend bets if I keep listening. Oh, that's good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and here's the thing: like, I'm good friends with Nick Clearwater, Golf Tech, and so I kind of like to say, "Hey, I was doing a little bit better than you know Golf Tech's uh, national year." <laughs> they talk about seven strokes annually. You know, we're a little bit better than that with the six month mark. But here's the thing: things kind of took a a big side turn because. I was still having some people come to me, Mark, that were saying, why is it that I always play well on the front side and I blow up on the back side? Why is it that I go and I do really bad on the front, but I do amazing on the back side? Why is it that I get to this one hole and it's like, no matter what I do, I always seem to hit it in the water. And it was these kind of things that these few students that, you know, kept coming to me and asking for answers and I didn't have an answer. And the reason why is because guess what? I, the instructor, was still struggling with a lot of these same things they were struggling with. Because when we go back to high school, when I was trying to study and do everything, you know, under the sun, I thought it was mental. And so my logical thing back in high school was, hey, let's go devour all the mental books. You know, you name it, I read it. You know, I'm a big Bob Rotella fan, uh, Vision 54, highly respect what Lynn and Pia have done for the game. And there's so many others. But the problem was it still didn't help me back then. And yet here I am as a coach and I still didn't have an answer for them, much less for my own game. Mm -hmm. And Mark, it finally came to a head in September of 2016. I'm having a lesson with a guy. Um, His name is James. And the interesting thing was on paper, this guy, when we would track him with stroke scan data, we'd do playing lessons. We'd go out, we use stroke scan data, and on paper and the report and everything is showing this guy should be in the mid to low 70s when he goes and plays, like in tournaments and stuff like that. Well, there's a bigger piece of that, but here's the thing. Ball striking-wise, he was hitting shots in practice like a guy that would be a low single-digit handicapper. But here's the issue. When you play in tournaments, he would be shooting scores in the upper 80s and low 90s. 
Yep. It drove me crazy. And mm -hmm. we finally had an honest conversation that evening. I'll never forget it. And I said, you know what? I think it's best that we part ways. Well, here's the That's thing. That's pretty big of you. Huh? Uh, but here's the thing, though. After that conversation, I was so frustrated as a coach and as a player, I quit the game that night. Oh, I started filling out resumes and I was sending them out to various job opportunities. And I actually closed down my doors to my golf school and I quit and stepped away. Hey, Shannon, I hope your story is a little less dramatic than this. Yeah, it's interesting. Well, I mean, because, sorry, go ahead. I was just wanted to just put, put a, bow, a, a, a bow on bow. Pardon that. I'm, I meant to pun over there. Um, well, look, obviously you close down the doors, then you're obviously back into it now, wildly successful, highly certified, write the book, super exciting. So uh, am I, am I, am I tying the bow there pretty well? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Fantastic. Then you, then Shannon's our bonus of you. Shannon, tell us your story before we dive into the stuff. So what's interesting is my, my background is in speed skating. Um, and I also played soccer growing up, played semi-pro and I got into cycling, um, after that. And um, what happened was when I was younger, um, the team that I skated for, um, well, I was national champion. I was national record holder in speed skating. And the team that I skated for actually had uh, 22 national champions on there, um, which in their individual age group. So like every time we'd step up to the line and practice, um, it was kind of like the who's who. Yes. You know, and and here I am, I'm like, you know, 30 years old racing the young guys. Um, but however, and I would get last off the start every single time, you know, every single time I would get last off the start um, and struggled at meets getting off the line and stuff like that. But however, when we're messing around and we're putting shoes on and, you know, we're doing sprints with shoes on. I'm beating everybody hands down. So I knew that there was a disconnect, very similar to how so many golfers have that disconnect from going from the range, going to the course, right? And so I had this huge disconnect and I knew it was mental. So I started digging into the mental books and, and doing research and everything like that. And then I figured out how to way to trigger your body to get in the zone on demand with, uh, and we call it with our system, we call it psychoneuromuscular training. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's very simple to, it's, it's kind of like Pavlov's dogs. You know, a lot of people that's taken psychology one-on-one, -on -one, they, they've heard that, heard about that study or done that study or, or, you know, it's classical conditioning. And that's what I did. I figured out a way to trigger just like the, the light or the buzzer would trigger um, the dog to salivate. Or, and if you notice, like when the dog wouldn't salivate, it would also get excited on yep. top of that. Mm -hmm. And so there was a, a physical representation of what was going on with the light as well as the, the saliva that was that was happening. Um, and so I figured out how to do that using, you know, uh, being back with uh, added added emotion and mental imagery um, and, and getting a trigger in it. And some people are like, there's no way you can trigger your body to get in the zone. And so my question would be the, to the to the audience to, to ask themselves, how many times did you actually uh, talked about your favorite dessert and your mouth starts watering. Yeah. So th it's because you, you've conditioned it, you know, to go into that. And then what it, what it did was it triggered my body to get in the zone. And what happened was I'm over the, the ministry team at my church and I wanted to get to know Bo and uh, because and he reached out and we started talking, had nothing to, our meeting had nothing to do with golf, had nothing to do with sports. We just wanted to get to know each other. Right. And so we're sitting there and I find myself out of all the topics where we could talk about to get to know, I'm telling him how I was able to trigger my body to get in the zone and, you know, and, and to react and to where um, I got to within, you know, kind of getting back to the story that I was doing. Once I started doing that and getting my mental reps in and stuff, like within one month, I was winning every start on the on the starting line on my team and then at meets i was winning starts at meets every time and so it literally shifted my mindset not just that but i ended up being a national champion because of it um and so i'm sitting there i'm going through telling Bo this when we sit down to, to for dinner and that's when i found out that he had uh, closed his golf school and everything like that and the funny thing was i actually i'm not even gonna spoil it i'm gonna let Bo 
finish finish uh, what our meeting was about. Okay, well, I'm guessing <laughs> this, this is too good. Okay, um, yes, I'm going to put the cart way in front of the horse because this is kind of what I do. Um, that's number one. Number two, it sounds like this book is completely serendipitous, and there's two people from different fields kind of meeting in the same place. Yes, and yes. and yep. to me, it's weird because you talk about the triggers and getting ready for competition, and everyone's got this like. Oh, I'm good in practice, or I wish I could take my practice swing to the golf course. And it's almost like their mental trigger, Bo, I'm going to ask for your response and then Shannon's. Their mental trigger is kind of like, oh, every time I go on the golf course, I suck. And and then the body starts to respond to that stimuli. Yes, your comments. Yes, it it, it is extremely important that people have a right frame of mind, right? Um, but when it comes to our system, that's the beautiful thing about what we teach with cycling muscular training is that when we start training the custom trigger and getting the body to respond to that, we can almost override a lot of the negative and stuff that's happened in the past. Because when you look at the game of golf, right, it's over three and a half, four hours. And then science has shown us that how often are you in the zone? It's usually about one to 2%. Well, guess what? That's pretty much the time it takes for you to hit your shot. Like that can be as much as five to 10 seconds over the course of a round. That can be as much as maybe 20 minutes total. So we just need to be, you know, fully focused. We call it caveman golf, C target, C ball, hit ball. And when we get to that place, we know that that's where your best performance is always going to come from. Science has shown us that, well, let's just pack up and just, let's just say the obvious. Have we ever heard a Hall of Fame athlete or any, you know, goat of all time, right? You know, when we talk about Michael Jordan, we talk about Tiger Woods, we talk about Jack Nicklaus, or we talk about Michael Phelps. I don't think we've ever heard them say in a press conference after an amazing performance, you know, I had my elbow placed at 45 degrees and I had my fingers tossed and I had to make sure that I get this pressure on it at about 30%. And if I just released it at the right angle, it's going to go in. No, we never hear them say that. We always hear them say, you know, I was zeroed in on my target. I saw the angle of approach. Well, here's an example. I'll never forget what David uh, shared with me one time. He asked Aaron Badley, Aaron, what's your secret to success? You know, what Aaron told him, he said, I see in real time, the ball going into the hole. But then he goes one step further. He says, I also see it in reverse motion. Now, isn't that interesting? Uh, so that right there is an example of what it takes to play at a high level and they're using mental imagery or some form of it. And, you know, kind of going back to what Shannon was just sharing a minute ago, when we had that conversation at dinner that night, when Shannon shared that his secret, and here, let me give full context. He hasn't shared this yet. He coached, after he retired, 142 national champions, eight world champions, and two Olympic medalists. When Shannon, he told me that. Shannon, why we got him on the show? I could just switch him off and you and I talk, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> you can't. You can't for the price of one. <laughs> but let me just say this, though, because I'm going to say what everybody's thinking right now. When he shared that his secret was to get people to trick their bodies, get in the zone, I laughed. And it, I said, Shannon, you're full of crap. Mm -hmm. And I said, I please don't mean any disrespect, but you have to understand what I stepped away from two years ago. Yeah. Because we met, and this is over dinner in 2018. We're in the summer of 2018 when we have this dinner. Um, and I said, do you understand? I understand that it could have worked for speed skating. And I'm still arguing with him a little bit. But this is when he takes out his phone. And Mark, he's doing this right here on his phone. He's going over here. And I'm still arguing and making all these things and rebuttals and everything else. And uh -huh. then he goes, and then he goes and grabs another screenshot. And then he gets another screenshot. And then he shows me another text message and then another text message. And these are all texts and screenshots of all of his national champions, world champions, and one of his Olympic medalists. And they're all saying custom trigger, custom trigger, custom trigger, custom trigger. And I said, Shannon, you know, this may work for speed skating, but it's not going to work for golf. Golf is the hardest sport in the world. I said, I still don't believe you. Okay. And uh, you, you realize, of course, at the time, because he is in ministry, this stuff is heaven sent apparently too, huh? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Keep fighting. Keep going. Yeah, that's true. So here's the interesting thing. I said, you know what? I have nothing to lose. 
And I really, I had no desire. When I, when I closed down my golf school, Mark, I literally had no desire to ever come back in a game of golf. And like I shared with you, I had some great mentors. As a res result of that great mentor, I've actually developed some amazing relationships and friendships with some of the who's who in the teaching part of the game. So I'm surrounded by everybody that you would think would be able to get me to a place as a player and as a coach, right? But yet, I didn't have an answer. And that's why I was so frustrated and I walked away. But then I said to Shannon, I said, you know what? I haven't touched a club in two years. I'm a prime candidate for this. I said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go prove you wrong. And I, I said, here's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to prove you wrong. And he was laughing, by the way. So yep. I was like, and I said, here's how I'm going to do it. I'm not going to touch a club. I'm not, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to physically practice. I'm not going to go hit warm up balls before the round. I'm only going to hit a few putts and I'll go straight to the uh, first tee cold turkey. Mark, in the second half of that year, I play eight rounds, and I shoot six out of eight rounds under par. My handicap went from a previous 2.4 index to a plus 1.7, all within a five- to six-month time span. Hey, the proof is in the pudding, huh? I, you know, that, that's an incredible story, and I'm so glad you would share it. Because I know, look, I got into golf instruction because I, I, apparently I told my dad when I was a kid I wanted to be a teacher. And so now I'm just marrying my my passion and what I guess I'm coded to do. Um, but I got into golf instruction and I realized there are very few golfers ever playing well. And if they are, they are blinking of eye, a blink of an eye from playing poorly. And, and to that, Shannon, I, I had a guy, fascinating man called Mike Wasserleeson on the show. He's got a company called Move You. And a uh, very, very smart dude from California. And it's basically an online way to rid yourself of pain by moving your body correctly, just getting into shape, right? And he jokes, he calls, he goes, you got to fix your shit. And that's basically his tagline. And I got him on, yeah, and he was working with Antonio Brown at the time, you know, wide receiver for the Steelers and then whoever else before the this, this stuff went wrong. And he said, Antonio, at the line of scrimmage, they used to work on him kind of cycling his body into position to run the route fast off the mark. Uh, with with the with the theory being that he goes, look, you got a fancy BMW, you can't go from zero to a hundred in the blink of an eye. You got to be have the car revving and then you let the brake go. You don't hit the accelerator when the gun goes off. Now I'm talking your language and speak speed skating kind of thing. Mm -hmm. That was just cycling his body. So Antonio AB would go like he'd just almost wake up everything and then they'd call the play and he'd go. So now help me with new neuromuscular training, because to me, working the mental side of it is harder than working the physical side of it, because it's so easy to give up on, you know, because I feel like recovering golf instructor, um, when you're on the range, there's always something you can try, right? And it's all physical. Um, but being true to mental stuff is like having faith. It's, it's hard to see, hard to feel. So help me now understand this neuromuscular mental training. Oh, no, no, pardon me. I'm saying it wrong. Yeah, psycho-neuromuscular training. Because it's, look, I'm on board. You, you had me at hello. So, so, please, so please wake me up now. <laughs> so what, what's interesting is, you know, um, <clears throat> you hear a, a lot of the uh, top coaches around the world, and you hear... Uh, athletes around the world, they'll, they'll even say this, not just in golf, but I mean, golf, like what, what Bo said, it is, it is the very, the toughest mental sport because of what's going on. Um, and, and it's so mental that like, for example, you cannot duplicate the same swing over and over again, because if you could, the ball would land in the exact same spot every single time you teed it off. Mm -hmm. um, and so golf is first and foremost, you know, uh, one of the things that we teach it, golf is a game of mistakes. So then it helps your outcome going in there. But the reason why I say that is because um, when you have that strategy and what the, what they say is, you know, 90% mental, 10% physical, or depending on the person, it might be less, you know, it might be 75% mental, 25% physical, but yet we're spending all this time on only uh, on, on only 10% of the game, the physical part of it, you know, when it comes to swings and stuff like that. So when it comes to doing the trigger, one of the things that I would do is you're you're we're incorporating and we are using mental imagery uh, to help trigger the body, uh, but also adding a, an emotion to it 
that gives you a heightened level of uh, awareness of where the target is. Yeah. And what you're doing is, and when you're, when you're incorporating those three, your target, and, and it's what I call CPR. And what, what is CPR? CPR is, um, when do you use CPR? Is when somebody's, you know, dead and you yeah. want to, you know, put them back to life and get them back. And so, but I call it, you know, consistent, passionate reaction. And so you we're adding that and what it is is like so you hear you hear of mental imagery all right um but then there's another level of mental imagery that's called kinesthetic mental imagery where you're adding an emotion to it okay. uh, and what I so what I like to say is when we're doing mental imagery first and foremost the elite athletes and not and it doesn't have to you don't have to be elite when I say that, it's just that their attention to detail is unreal in making things real. That and, and so that's one of the things that we have to do when we do mental imagery. We have to get all five senses involved, as you know, as, as you've heard. But I like to call it seven senses. You, you When it comes to mental imagery, you got to get seven senses. And you're like, what do I mean? Well, you have to get the limb movement activated as well. Mm -hmm. Feeling your golf swing, feeling like for me, when I, when I speed skating, coming off the starting line, my muscles, you know, driving the same thing, getting the, getting your golf swing dialed in and getting the feeling of the motion. So now you have limb movement and then you add that, uh, the emotion to it, what I call CPR, that consistent passionate reaction. Um, and, and I love how Bo talks about that. So I'm going to let Bo just briefly talk about what like his emotion, emotional effect and adding that in there. Please do. Okay. I love the seven senses thing. You got me on board. I was involved in a session yesterday where um, there was a very talented young lady who was working. I was privy to a, a, a session with a sports psychologist and they were just really dialing in her target focus and not just saying there's the target. They're like, right, where's the start line? How's it? Where's the end line? You know, how high is it? So, so really getting into the minutiae, like you say, the, the details of it. But here's the thing, Bo, and I want you to talk about it, but I want to just preface it with this, because I guarantee you that people going, yeah, I've tried visualization. Jeez, man, Jack Nicholas talks about seeing the movie role of his shot. He goes, I lose the thing halfway through and I just give up kind of thing. Then you, you, you're feeling me where I'm going. So, so, yeah. so help guys like me over there. Yes. Well, you know, for those that struggle with visualization or even question it, here's what I would challenge them. And this is something when we look at the last 50, 60 years in this game, everybody's been looking for the answer is the perfect swing. Mm -hmm. Well, Mark, because of my relationship, and I know you've been out there inside the ropes for a long portion, obviously it's no secret. Um, but here's the thing. How many times have you seen guys in, like outside the top 500 or top 1,000, they Monday qualify in or they get a sponsor's exemption, something like that. Isn't it interesting that some of those guys have better swings than the guys that are inside the top 10? Heck yes. Uh, heck yes. And, and I've been, you know, in my <laughs> former career as a elite golf instructor, I've been hired and fired by the same people often because the swing of theirs that they're developing, it's, it's a mercurial thing. And it's, and, and it's an, it's a never ending search for perfection. And every day you're different because your body is different every day. And if you're trying to perfect that golf swing, I'm more inclined to want to per perfect the response to the swing and perfect what happens before the swing, because you're not going to perfect the swing. Golly. I mean, this, this is a, this is the, it's impossible. Yeah, that's a thousand percent correct. So then here's, what's interesting is that when you look at someone like Tiger, you look at Phil Mickelson, you look at Jet Nicholas. Let's just look at Jack Nicholas, Sam Snead, Ben Hogan, and then Mickey Wright on the LPGA side of things. Right. Some amazing Hall of Fame careers, right? Well, let's go a little bit deeper. Who was Jack Nicholas's first childhood coach? It was Jack Grout, yeah. right? Now, who was Jack Grout's mentor? His mentor was Alex Morrison. Oh, really? Okay. Okay. Now, Sam Snead and Ben Hogan both shared the same coach. Who was it? It was Henry Pickard. Yes. Now, who was Henry Pickard's mentor? It was Alex Morrison. I could see that one coming, right? Yeah. Now, Mickey Wright is probably the second, probably, you know, best ever on the LPGA side of things. Incredible career. Who was her coach? Harry Pressler. I know, I know. I know the answer to the next one. 
Okay. That's Alex okay. Morrison. So who is this Alex Morrison guy? And why has he not been giving, you know, the same kind of treatment that we kind of put Henry Pickard and some of these other coaches on a pedestal, right? Well, hopefully we are kind of giving him some type of tribute through our work. But I want to say this. Alex Morrison was the first ever to actually really study swings and photographs and stuff like that. But here's the other thing about Alex Morrison. He was the first ever to write the book in 1940 called Better Golf Without Practice. Wait a second. Better Golf Without Practice. Here's the interesting that Alex Morrison did. And there's so many good things in this book, but I'll share one story. He's mm-hmm. working with a well-known comedian, Lou Lord. This guy could not break 90. He had tried everything under the sun, everything. And he comes to Alex Morrison. He said, I'm literally at wit's end. Can you help? Alex Morrison sits him in a chair. They do not touch a club or go practice physically over two weeks. They rehearse in the chair what Alex calls the five Morrison swing keys. They're just doing nothing but mental imagery. The very first round, he goes out and shoots 87. (laughs) Now, why do I say all that? Because when it comes to really elevating your game to the next level, there's always going to be some form of kinesthetic mental imagery that people are using. When you look at Tiger Woods, here's what's funny about Tiger Woods, and I really respect all the guests that you're bringing onto the show, like David Spiegel uh, and, and then um, Dr. Andrew Huberman. Yeah, have, you not- have you noticed? Uh, have you noticed pivot the tech I'm taking you in early 2024? <laughs> yeah, I know. I put the golf coaches aside for a little while. Hey, look, I, it, it's real. I'm sensing this more and more because I'm getting back into instruction a bit when I have time. And so I'm, I'm, I'm can cherry pick a little bit and I'm picking, you know, talented aspirant golfers and yeah. my goodness gracious one, the decision making they, they adopt is ridiculously poor. And then just the self talk, all of the stuff that, cause I, you said point out, I have the luxury to be around the best of the best when they're playing their very best and I can see what they're doing and I can hear what they're saying. And and the, the the difference between that and these aspirin golfers is like the North and the South Pole being far away from each other. It's 2,000%. So when you look at, for an example, Tiger Woods, you know, here's the interesting thing. Now, he does share this in his book, but he was also sharing this at a clinic in the early 2000s. And the reason why Tiger has made some of those iconic putts in history in his over the course of his career, like some of the most pressure filled moments where he's won some incredible majors as a result of these putts that he's made. Here's what he said in the clinic one time. He said, on the outside, I look very calm and collective, big body language. But on the inside, I'm extremely nervous. He said that, openly said that. But he said, here's what I do. I am standing beside the putt. I'll take a couple practice strokes, but I'm looking one time and I take a picture. Kind of like the old Polaroid cameras. That's basically what he's describing. So he's looking at the hole and he's taking a picture. Then he steps up over the ball, takes another look, picture. Then sets up, does one last final look, picture. And then when he brings his eyes back to the ball, he says internally to himself, all right, Tiger, just put to the picture just like Papa used to say. Guess what? That's mental imagery. Mm. And that was one of the biggest keys to his success and why he dominated in this game. Now, let's go one step further. Sam Snead and Tiger are right now tied with the all-time PGA Tour wins in history. Now, here's the funny thing. Bob Rotella shares the secret to why Sam Snead dominated the game. You go to Chapter 2 of his book, The Golfer's Mind. Bob Rotella stands up at a seminar. Now, this is a make-or-break seminar. And those of you that read it or even know anything about Bob Rotella, he could literally have his career ended if Sam Snead stands up and says, this guy's full of crap, don't listen to him. But what does Sam Snead actually do? After Bob gets done doing his talk, Sam Snead stands up and says, we need to listen to what this young man is saying. Mm -hmm. And then Sam Snead goes on and shares, the reason why I did so well in my career is because I would go to bed every night and I would envision the night before the round, me playing, you know, about the whole 10, hold a 12, 14, whatever, and I'd fall asleep, wake up the next day, feel great, go through my morning routine, and I'd have a great round. Now, granted, he does struggle later on in his career, and he goes away from that. But what's interesting is you go and you look at um, Bob's news book, How Champions Think. He actually shares that Sam Steed gets himself out of those putting woes later in his career by actually going back and doing mental imagery to fix it. Well, I guess then, Shannon... Um, you guys have written the book. I've, I've heard the inspiration for it. Um, the book is called In the Zone Secrets. 
So you guys are basically inside of the book sharing the secrets to this mental imagery and to, to psycho neuromuscular training and these triggers to get one going. Because again, I, I want to visit with you real fast. This can overcome nerves and stuff too, because I've got some juniors playing a tournament this afternoon. And I know one of them is nervous right now. And then because of nerves, your mind starts running rampant a little bit. And then all of a sudden, you've scuttled your own performance. You, you care to comment there? Yeah, 100%. I mean, it, well, mental imagery can calm the anxiety because it's going to bring a lot more confidence because you're seeing yourself over and over again perform at the highest level mm -hmm. under pressure. However, at the same time, let's look at let's look at the stimulus of what nervousness is. What is it? You know, um, the, like let's say you're talking about your juniors the night the night before their big round. What are they feeling? Well, they probably got knots in their stomach. You know, they're they're having visions of the future, like what in the world's going to happen. Nightmares uh, about missiles and stuff. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You, you know, they might even have cold sweats. You know, sweaty palms and and you know and everything like that. Well, then. Now let, let's 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 shift it and do a, a 180. You know, when I was a kid, I used to have wonderful, I had great Christmases. And Christmas night on 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 Christmas Eve, um, what was the stimulus that was going through my mind? I had visions of the future, mm -hmm. cold sweat, naughty stomach, like what in the world's going on? So it's the same stimulus that I was having. One was an exciting version and then, and then the other ones is the nervous version. Yeah. So then we need to reframe our brain. If it's the same stimulus, simply by saying, I, I would tell the juniors, let's do this. Every single time you think about it, say out loud, this is exciting. And I can't wait to perform because it's going to give me an opportunity to showcase my talent. Something as simple as that. Yeah. But then not just that, every single time they're doing mental imagery and it, uh, I like to call, I don't like to call it positive self-talk. I like to call it power talk Okay. because the reason why is because what words can do to your body, it can change so many things. You know, it can dilate your blood vessels. It can lower or, or raise your heart rate, blood pressure. I mean, all the stuff that words can do um, in your body. But then what happens is when we keep telling ourselves that we start believing it. Yeah, You know, and, and then there was a study that was done out of Harvard. It said that when you speak something positive, it has 10% more likely of a chance that it'll affect you some way, somehow. However, if you speak something negative, it has a 40 to 70 times more to affect you some way, somehow. So why not? Let's just get rid of the negativity. The people that want to berate themselves after a whole, well, guess what? It's affecting you. It's like you're carrying a mental brick. Mm -hmm. And it's getting heavier and heavier and heavier because of all the words that you're laying on top of it and you're believing it, right? So let's get rid of that, totally eliminate that behavior and start focusing on the positive. And so reframe that every single time you're doing your mental imagery and doing that, reframe this to exciting. This is my chance to, adversity is my advantage. You know, um, the harder it gets, the harder I get. The longer, the longer it goes, Guess what? The better I get. That's for, you know, the the tour players and they're going on their, their third day of, of competing and they started getting fatigued, mental fatigue and everything like that. Let's let's flip the script and reframe um, how we talk about it and how we view it, because then what will happen? The reason why I say that is I had a client that um, she in speed skating made the world team and she uh, also represented the U.S. for at the Pan American Games as well. But then she started, um, anxiety started getting into her and she started, because here's the thing, we can't control negative thoughts. Now, a lot of people out there be like, no, well, yes, I can. Well, so, well, if you can, then why do you have negative thoughts? We can't control them. They're random. They come in. It's how we react to the negative thoughts that changes everything. Well, then when, when what happens, my, my definition of depression, for example, is someone that is um literally obsessed with the past sure. yep. anxiety i mean it's a simple i mean i'm just saying it's very simple anxiety is someone who's obsessed with the future gotcha and so if, when you get those words and those thoughts that come in if we entertain those guess what we're building a stronghold in our brain mm -hmm. in that right and so what we need to do is totally reframe it and so i was working with her and literally within this her first major competition was about two months after I started working with her. She went to Columbia, did some international 
events there and then went to France and then went to Germany and did international events there. Her mom told me she could not even recognize her anymore because of the the amount of confidence that she was portraying coming up to the starting line. And and, and matter of fact, being more laughy, being more her personality, yeah. you know, nothing phased her. And then her times were actually lower than what she was doing in practice. Why? Because she's refocused. It's her time to perform. It's time to release the the her true identity, so to speak. It's yes. Um oh, I'm we're staying in golf golf fans, but this is just sport. And this is human, right? Because we're all humans who play a sport, whatever it might be, skis, uh, speed skating or golf or or tennis. And and I, I want to pitch this to you, Bo. Because you use the term, and I love this. I'm going to use this personally. Breaking your internal thermostat of shooting the same score. Mm. And like I watched a tennis match yesterday. Open disclosure, it's my youngest daughter. And in practice, she's sensational. She went into the match, and then everything would sort of slow down in an effort not to fail. She won the match, but she didn't play as well as what she was capable. Then her and I watched tennis on TV. It's uncanny, and I see this week in and week, week out on the tour. These guys, the shots they hit on Sunday afternoon, they can't hit that stuff any other day of the week. And the guys in the tennis court, the rallies they're having are just psycho. They're so good, and they're just teeing off like they're not concerned with the result whatsoever. And when they get in that place, Bo, they almost get, or, or I guess the internal athlete you know that one starts showing up as is this what you're kind of talking about with that concept when we talk about the internal thermostat and i think this is going to be really important for everybody that's listening to this because one of the biggest things that a lot of these people struggle with is like shooting the same scores over and over and over again right and so when we talk about the internal thermostat everybody whether they recognize it or not they have an internal thermostat that's running in the background just like a thermostat that controls the temperature in your home so if it's really cold outside you got this regulating temperature say your house is set to 72 degrees fahrenheit if it's really cold on it's going to set the heat on it's going to raise it up if it's really hot outside it's going to bring the ac on and it's going to lower the temperature back down to where you always are well People's golf games are very much the same way when it comes to their scores. This is why people struggle with when they go out and they play the front side really bad, but then on the back side, let's say they shoot 46 on the front. And this is like a 12 handicapper, right? But then on the back side, he gets really focused and he's like, all right, I gotta get, I gotta get into it. And then he comes in the back side and he shoots like 38. And it's like, no matter what, even if they uh, play really well on the front side, but then they blow up on the backside, same thing, vice versa. They always seem to end up, no matter where what they do, they're always there. Now, here's the interesting thing. I'll share kind of a scenario. How often has it been, like for those that play really well on the front side, where they shoot like 36, and let's say this is like a 14 handicap player. They shoot 36 on the front side, and on the cart ride to the number 10 tee, their buddies are like, you just realize you just shot 36 and then he's like man yeah i did yeah i think uh i might have my lifetime low round yeah this might be your best round of the year and then they go to the back side and isn't it interesting within like the first two holes if not that very tee shot they snap hook it ob and then they make double and then it's another double bogey and then it's another bogey and then before you know it they shoot 46 47 on the back side and then they end up where they always are yeah well the interesting thing about the internal thermostat, Mark, that was the biggest thing I struggled with throughout my career. In junior golf, I can't tell you how many times I would start and be three or four under through the first seven, eight holes. And Mark, this is what I would do. I would be like, after that seventh, eighth hole being like three or four under, I'm like, man, this might be my lowest round of the year. This might be my lifetime low round. Man, I can't wait to get home and share this with my parents. And I can't wait to call my grandma, who was really important to me and actually introduced, introduced me to the game, um, to like share with her. And, you know, I'm sitting there daydreaming and I'm portraying all these situations and scenarios. And then the train comes off the tracks. Mm -hmm. And so this is a dilemma that we talk in depth in the book about. And we also show you how to actually break that. See, the first issue that most people are struggling with is that they're surprised with how well they're playing. What that does is when they recognize, oh man, this is good. This is like, wow, I'm like uncharted territory. That's a communication to the internal thermostat that's governing your game right now. And it's saying, hey, something is off, do something about it. And unfortunately what happens is then bad shot, bad hole, bad shot and then or vice versa they play really really bad on the front side 
and then they're communicating to the internal thermostat we got to do something different and then they get really focused and they play really well on the backside to still finish where they always are so to break that we have to change what their identity is as a golfer and i'll share a quick story and this is a story we also share in the book but I always love the story that Tom Bailu and Trevor um, Mowat, I think is his last name, but he was the uh, sports psychologist to Alabama during the years when Alabama was dominating in football with Nick Saban. Mm -hmm. So here's a conversation that Trevor was sharing with Tom on impact theory. He said his dad came home from a Toastmasters conference and he said, you got to hear what just was shared at this conference. And he said, the guy that was sharing the story said that there was a kid in high school that was hanging around all the bad people. And this is a true story. And he was hanging around the wrong people, you know, probably into drugs, doing all the th wrong stuff. And it was his junior year. And at that time, you know, we were, we need to take the SAT. And so he's like, you know what the heck, I'll go take the SAT. Well, he goes and takes the SAT. He gets a score back that he scored 1480 out of a possible 1600 back then. Yeah. At that point, when he gets home and is showing his mom, his mom asked him, son, did you cheat? And he said, well, I tried. I really tried because, you know, but the problem was the seats were too far apart and I couldn't. Okay, right. And here's the thing. His teachers thought they had missed a boat on him. And they're like, okay, we need to start pouring more into him. And he actually decides to start sitting at the front of the class. He cut all ties with his bad friends. He starts doing all the right behaviors that a person that would be smart would do. And he graduates high school, he goes to community college because his GPA was so low, he didn't have enough to get up to where he needs. He goes, I think a year or two in community college, transfers to an Ivy League school, and then graduates with honors, and then becomes the founder and CEO of the most successful magazine company in the world. 13 years go by. He gets a letter in the mail, and his wife uh, puts it on the counter. And he goes there for about a day or two. And finally his wife's like, are you gonna open this? And he said, okay, fine, I'll open it. He opens it. It's from the SAT editorial board. And it said, you know, periodically we uh, review our test taken policies. And unfortunately, we found that you were one of 12 students sent the wrong scores. You actually scored a 740, not a 1480. <laughs> now, wait a second. Yeah, yeah. I thought that your past always predicts your future. Not in this case. And so for him, what happened was that he believed in this identity, even though he was not. He was a 740, but he believed and acted like a 1480. And because he did that, he did the behaviors of a 1480 student. And guess what? The rest is history. Now, how does this apply to golf? Well, if we constantly believe in this internal thermostat, whether we recognize it or not, that we are always like a 15, 20 handicap, and we're trying to get to a single digit, but we keep behaving and acting like a 15, 20 handicap, then why are we surprised that we're not shooting low single digit scores? Yeah, okay. The key to break that is you have to change identity and the rest is going to come in. To okay, I've, kept, I've kept you guys for a long time, but I want to touch this, um, Shannon. Look, it, I guess it comes down to speaking life into every situation all of the time. And you've got to be brave enough as the individual in the middle of the, the melee to do it yourself because people can talk that stuff into you, but you can be immune and, and numb to the stuff, right? Um, but then you guys talk about the value of breathing and the psychological sigh. Now I'm a believer. Um, I've partnered up with neuro peak pro they've been on the show and I can, Will Zalatoris was talking to me just the other day about it, how it's helping him get back surgery and the breathing is just helping him deal with stuff easier. So, so help us there too, because like if we watch races, Shannon, if it's Olympics is coming up in 24. You watch the races or whatever, the gymnasts, swimmers before the uh, the race when you're you're going to be defined in a mere matter of seconds, right? You can see the focus, the intensity, not the tension, but the breathing. So talk about that psychological sigh and the value thereof, please. Yeah. The um, now this is the the study actually came out um, last year in January. It used to be called the cyclic sigh. And then they actually changed the name of it to physiological side. Um, and it's just uh, psychological, forgive me. <laughs> no, that's okay. That's a, but but actually I love it. Psychological. Because, because that's what you're doing is you're it's like literally what you're doing, it's like a a, a dishwasher for your brain. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Okay, because you're you're clearing it out, um, so you can actually think clearly um, and, and and more. And uh, so what happens is what what the physiological sigh is is very simple. It's like it's like two seconds deep breath in, and then uh, it's like two breaths, two seconds deep in, and then a, one second of a further deeper breath, and then a quick pause, and then six seconds out. So it kind of looks like you know if you can hear me on here, it's like a Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is uh, the, the very first deep breath that fills your lungs up. Well, then there's sacs that's all around your lungs. The second deep breath fills up those sacs in the lungs on top of that. So then what happens is you have an increased heart rate. And then with the six second breath out, it actually decreases your heart rate even lower. And so what it does is it's, it's actually very similar to uh, with the case study that was done out of Stanford they actually had over 700 participants that was in this case study. Now they did all kinds of different breathing techniques with it as well. And they found out that this one was the king of them all. Mm -hmm. And they realized it can actually, it's, it will lower your stress level. You're like, for example, if you did that for five minutes in the morning, it'll lower your stress level. It very light. You know, when you wake up, you have your, your resting heart rate. Yeah. So it lowers your, 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 uh, stress level your base stress level so then it takes you longer to get in a very high high stress state by doing that and so one of the things that we say is okay do the physiological sigh for example let's say before you getting ready to hit the ball because what it's doing is it's like doing a, a washing machine to your brain mm -hmm. um as well and then we, we kind of added a, a little trick to it. We, uh, Izzy, Dr. Izzy Justice, I don't know if you're familiar with him. Yeah, uh, he yeah. actually uh, did a, a, a technique where very similar, you take a deep breath in and you squeeze as hard as you can, and then you, you slowly release out. So we just kind of paired the physiological side with, with that on top of it. And so then now you're getting the, the calm effect of the, the lower stress level. But also with Dr. Izzy Justice, because he's done over 12,000 brain scans of our brain, he's actually proved that you're getting what he calls, and it's not just him, there's other psychologists and, and people that are in the mental performance, getting your brain out of red light state, getting it back down to green light to where you can go. Mm. And what happens is when you do that, let's say you do the physiological side, and at the top of the side, you squeeze as hard as you can from a level of... Uh, a, 10 you're going at 11 and then for the last six seconds of the breath out you slowly release your hands what will happen is it's like doing 20 minutes of yoga in your brain yeah love it and hey. then you're you're releasing that stress and we use that as like a release so here's the thing after a bad shot what do you do do that as a release yeah you know to to release it to kind of get your brain because it'll clean out um and, and it'll help you but then if you do it before you're getting ready to hit a a, a great shot you're going to be a lot more relaxed a lot more calm you'll notice that the target will be more real to you as well because you got less going on in your brain yeah so true hey um well those neuropeak guys they work with a number of players on the tour victor hovland jordan speed keegan bradley has just started with them and if you watch keegan in his pre-shot routine he actually holds his hand to his diaphragm and he takes like a couple, three seconds in and breathes it out. And that's part of the routine now pre-shot. And and then, I mean, there's, there, there's a synergy between everything. Like I had Ryan Dewey on the show. He's the founder of Cold Plunge, you know, because it's been proven now that cold plunging is good for all manner of ills with the body. Oh, yeah. In that cold water the first time, you're like, <clears throat> and then you start to, you know, it's like panic. And then you start to breathe into the calm state of it. And then all of a sudden yeah. your body kind of finds balance, which is what we're looking for competing at whatever level. Yes, absolutely. All right. hundred percent. Okay, boys, this has been tremendous. I can't keep you for too long, but people can find you and they can find uh, the book certainly. So Bo, why don't you share where they can find you and the book, please? Absolutely. You can find us, uh, you can go to our website, endazonementaltraining.com. Uh, if you would like to get the book and get it even less than Amazon, you can actually go to our direct website, which is endazonesecrets.com. And uh, that way you can actually get the book uh, signed uh, from both Shannon and myself. And we got a lot of other cool things there for you as well. 
Fantastic. Are you, do you guys do social media? Yeah, we're on Instagram. Uh, we're not really focusing too much on it. We will later this year. Our main focus has been the writing of this book and working with our college teams and tour players. But, uh, you know, we've been kind of behind the scenes on that part. So we're going to be uh, ramping that up uh, later in this year. Or so we're pretty excited about that. But, yeah, you can find us on Instagram, uh, Bo Watson, and then you can also find Shannon Chusky there, too. Yeah. And um, also on in social media and on Facebook, uh, in the zone mental training on Facebook as well. If you, if you need to reach out or anything like that, contact and, but yeah, you guys it's look, this is a concept that everyone's heard about. Everyone's inquisitive about everyone's like, yeah, maybe I should try it. And then they're like, no, nah, I'd just rather go play golf or hit balls. Um, but you know, I think if I had to cap the whole thing, I'd just say in the end, we just all human beings trying to achieve something. And so getting the human of you figured out, the, the rest of it tends to want to fall into steps on. Yeah. It's, it, it's, so here's the thing. When it comes to mental training, it's work, but it's not hard work. It's just having the right strategy and what you're doing with the mental training and getting the reps in. It's like going to the gym. You know, if you go to the gym, um, you know, after the first day when you get back home and you look at yourself in the mirror, you know, you're not going to see any changes, right? Well, mental training is very similar to that, but actually there's a quick, a, a, a much more turnaround time when it comes to getting into your performance. So you're getting mental reps in that directly affects your physical re performance. And um, it, it's a huge, a, a huge game changer. Fantastic. Hey, you guys are the best. I appreciate you reaching out, Bo. Um, do keep in touch. This is fantastic work. I feel like it's kind of a frontier in golf, and I'm thankful that you guys are, are kind of uh, blazing the trail for all of us. Appreciate you. Yeah, thank you thank so much you. for having us on, Mark. Thanks, Mark, for having us. Yeah.